Good morning, I'm Beth Berry. I'm Vice President of Business Development for Real Green Systems. We're based in Wald Lake, Michigan. We are a software and integrated marketing platform that serves the green industry. Today, my guest again is Fred Harvest. Fred ask it from harvester that's a that's a mouthful fred and we've had fred on a couple of different times and was warmly received i talked to several of our customers who walked through your swot analysis and they gave me some excellent findings um, in particular as it related to covid and so i introduced the concept that we would be sharing the pest process this week so if you would fred introduce yourself in case uh, our listeners missed the last go round on SWAT, tell us what you do with the Harvester Group, and then introduce the concept of the pest analysis we're gonna walk through today. All righty, well, thank you, Beth, and it's good to be with you again, good to be with the Real Green team and uh, and the uh, Real team, uh, Real Green Universe. So, um, my name's Fred Haskett, I'm principal with the uh, Harvest Group. We're a business consulting uh, firm that focuses entirely on the lawn care landscape and tree care industries. Um, all of the principals have spent uh, in, a, in, in excess of 35 plus years uh, in the business. Myself, I was 42 years in when I uh, became part of the Harvest Group and started doing consulting work. So uh, I have been with uh, several large companies uh, and owned my own company in my hometown uh, in Dover, Ohio in the 1980s. It was a lawn care business, uh, residential lawn care. Um, I then uh, spent some time with J.C. Ehrlich's on the early green team on the East Coast. That was a multi-state, multi-branch lawn care operation. Uh, and then uh, matriculated over to the Brickman Group. Uh, they were one of my clients uh, in uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington area. And uh, they uh, recruited me and I moved over to the landscape maintenance side of the business and uh, was a regional manager in the St. Louis market. Uh, had Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City, and uh, Columbia, Missouri. So uh, spent some time there and then I uh, spent uh, about a decade with U.S. Lawns, the franchise group, uh, as a senior regional manager with them. And uh, my last corporate gig was uh, helping a landscape construction company in Southern California uh, expand into the maintenance division. They had to reboot themselves. They were about a $45 million concern uh, and uh, had were construction only. Uh, and they took a big hit in the 08, 09 uh, recession and uh, had no real recurring revenue base. So uh, the challenge there was to build that up and make them a more stable organization. And uh, so after I completed that 42 year internship, I became a consultant and today I help, uh, I, I work with 30 plus companies, uh, lawn care, tree care and landscape companies uh, around the country. And uh, I manage, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching for those owners and those leadership teams. And I also facilitate peer groups, I call them the harvest leaders groups. I have several of those, they're focused on, some of the groups are focused on landscape some are design build and a couple of the groups are lawn care only. So we kind of keep the the uh, the business models kind of segregated with those. So so that's what I do. That is very cool. So last week we talked about SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And that was certainly a great thought starter for many of the conversations I had with our customers last week. Just doing a state of the union, when I would check in with some of our customers, I would ask them those questions. And um, of course they would come up with um, opportunities that I hadn't thought about. One of them, and I don't know if I spoke to you after this, I spoke to Dusty Montiel at One Two Tree in Miami. And he said for the first time ever, they transitioned to a four day work week. Their technicians have been asking for it for a long time. They didn't think they would be able to balance the workload. Not only are they able to balance the workload, maybe they have one person. Um, so they're working Monday, they have a shift Monday through Thursday and a shift Tuesday to Friday with one person for Saturday, Sunday, but they may or may not go back to the traditional um, workload. And he said they now have an opportunity to prove that we can get the same amount of work done and work around the weather because they are in Miami. But he said, that's an opportunity 
that if you would have called me 90 days ago, I would have said, we're not interested in trying that. So timing is everything. And that's why when you, when I asked you to walk through the squat exercise, you brought this up. I had heard of the PEST concept um, years ago, have not been through it for many years, but in, as they say, unprecedented and uncommon times, it really makes a lot of sense. So tell us how we're gonna frame the conversation today. Okay, well, uh, again, part of strategic planning uh, is doing what we call a SWOT analysis, which is what you talked about earlier, which is analyzing you from an internal and an external uh, view of the world as it pertains to your organization. And that's the strengths and weaknesses internally of your company, and then externally the the uh, the opportunities and threats that any current situation or the current reality presents to you. Now, um, you know, I've always done those as a part of strategic planning processes, and uh, and I thought this was an excellent time with all the things that are going on right now uh, in the world today that we're facing was to start to have companies do that. Because everybody's asking me about rebudgeting, how do I adjust my plan, how do I learn to forecast, things of that nature. And maybe something just to kind of prime the pump was to start talking about and thinking with them about doing a SWOT analysis. Now, another piece of that puzzle that's been out there for a while, I think it was kind of conceived in the late 60s uh, by a Harvard professor who wrote a book, uh, Scanning the Business Environment. And um, he developed the concept, uh, it's kind of an extension of a SWOT analysis called a pest analysis on that. And it's typically done with larger organizations that are in multiple locations. Uh, so you don't see it a lot uh, in our industry. Uh, I've only seen it once or twice uh, really in our industry. Um, uh, I, there were several that were done uh, in, during the recession in 08, 09 with some of the larger organizations I was with. Uh, but it's kind of an interesting thing. And again, it's called a pest analysis and it stands for, uh, it's not part of the pest control business, so we're not talking about uh, a line of business here, but it's political, um, it stands for the P, and um, so, and then uh, economic, is the E, social or socio-cultural and technological. So it's looking at your business from the outside. It's entirely how are outside forces affecting what we do every day, both uh, you know on a day-to-day -day basis and at kind of an annualized basis. So it's a very interesting exercise. So you're looking at you know what's going on externally that's not part of what we do every day, but is affecting or could potentially affect us in a positive or a negative way. And how do we, again, how do we deal with the things that are threats? How do we deal with the things that are opportunities that are presented from those kind of things on that? So it's taking a look, for, it's, it's stepping outside and looking at your business for how outside forces affect those situations. And I think we've had a little bit of everything with the COVID-19 crisis. We've got political issues going on with all these state and local shutdown orders and you know shelter in place orders and things of that nature. There's been a lot of confusion uh, about those. They're very different in different parts of the country. Uh, again, interestingly enough, again, almost exclusively driven by political philosophies as to how certain states have reacted uh, on those kind of things. So there's a lot of things out there that, um, was that? obviously economic forces, uh, you know, the, the shutdown, the massive unemployment that was just, you know, when we see you switch off a robust economy and go from, what did we have? 3%, 2.5%, 3% unemployment. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we were basically at full, em uh, full employment plus plus with that and now all of a sudden we have almost you know 26 28 million people that have been laid off in the last 6 weeks because we turned off the economic engine we just flipped turned off the key on that and obviously social and cultural things how do we talk to our clients how do we talk to our employees with these kind of issues you know how it's affecting us on a personal level 
now because of all the things that we're involved with, with, you know, do we wear masks? Do we protect ourselves? How many people do we put in a truck? How do we get, how do we service our clients uh, properly and protect them and, and provide the services that protect their properties, things of that nature. And obviously technological issues, um, you know, we've had, again, we've looked at, uh, you know, different sanitation issues and things of that nature. Um, so this kind of thing is a great companion piece to a SWOT analysis. Uh, and it makes you, and it kind of stimulates, again, more thinking about how do we react? How do we take advantage of? How do we mitigate the problems that come from these outside forces on there? So I think for the leadership teams or the ownership teams of, of, uh, of our companies, we should be taking a look at not only the SWOT analysis, but also taking a look at the pest analysis as well and saying, how are these affecting us? How are we reacting to them? What can we do to make things better as it relates to all these things. And most of these things we do not control. We just have to react to them again, uh, again, being trying to be figure out how not to be just reactive, but proactive and, and try to mitigate some of these things coming at us. So again, it's just another way of looking at things and giving yourself a perspective that will allow you to do a better job of adapting to what is becoming a new normal through this so process let's, so let's start with political some of them are obvious but let's you and i brainstorm what some of the political aspects are that would impact our green industry yeah i mean obviously we have um all the new rules uh that are affecting our ability to service properties um and again we were shut down in certain areas we had uh, all kinds of sometimes very specific uh, orders uh, describing us as essential uh, operations. We had some very, very vague orders that were out there that everybody had to navigate through. And these were coming from our our leadership, both our, our state and local and federal leaders were trying to push this stuff down to the lowest level throughout there. And we had to react to those and they changed constantly i don't know how many times i was sending out updates to my clients uh and then you know then you know 72 hours later well i'm sending out another update because they changed everything again uh and then looking at those kind of things um i was really appreciated oh, i'm sorry Go ahead. i really appreciated the one thing that nalp did was they put that website out that had that link to all the state orders that was something that we were able then to get everybody onto. They could monitor their own local areas. But for about three week period before that was up and running, it was, you know, I was just bombarded with emails. What do I do about this? How do you interpret this, this paragraph? How do I interpret this statement in this, in the shelter in place order and things like that? How does this affect me? It was very confusing. Well, and it was, I don't, I won't say that it was intentionally confusing. Nobody was prepared for this, certainly not in the business space or the governmental space, but just in terms of that word being deemed essential. So obviously, you know, we're based in Michigan and we worked alongside MNLA to finally gain the essential status, but, um, and it was announced in a governor's um, press meeting but we're still continuing to work very hard to ensure that that word essential gets embedded in the Michigan executive order, just like it is in the CISA order, because we don't want to revisit this in 30 more days, that yes, it is essential. Um, and that there are certainly public health risks who are not doing so. So Michigan is probably the most extreme example of that. And we're going after that word, but what guidance would you give now that they're well of course all of the companies you and i both serve are in um, full production right now thankfully but do you think there's political opportunities on the tailwinds of this to reestablish relationships with state and local government to ensure that when this happens again i know where we were successful it would be because oh fred already knows the congressman on this committee and joe cusick already knows this person in the the michigan government and sometimes I think we don't spend enough time 
um, because it's not all that much fun, but being well acquainted and having working relationships with state and local government. Oh yeah, it's 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 a critical thing, and you know, I mean, I think you know when we had a lot of environmental issues, the lawn care groups had come together and were very focused on on things of that nature uh, through the through the NALP and that nature. The landscape organizations got involved in it with the H2B program and things like that. But this stuff kind of comes, it kind of wanes over time. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things where I think you, everybody can realize that, you know, maybe that those two issues, those point source issues that drove us to contact our congressmen and talk to their staff members and things of that nature um, are okay. That's great. But today we've discovered that we need to have an ongoing relationship because you never know what's going to happen. Um, and this is a classic example of how as we've become more connected globally and our supply chains are global and you know our food supply is affected by global things, everything is affected by everything uh, on the planet uh, today and um, you know keeping in touch and keeping a relationship with your local uh, at the county level, at the at the state level, and at the federal level, the congressmen and, and senatorial offices, it's really critical to have that relationship because when you call them, they then know who you are on that pro, you know, in that in that thing. So you know, it can't be just the issue of the moment. It's now become an ongoing process because we never know what's going to come next on that so we need to have that be a permanent part of our process you know because they're making decisions for us uh and and you know and and, and some of these decisions have been you know very quick very fast not well thought out uh obviously some of them have been influenced by political uh standings and and uh, and ideology and and again the better relationship you have with your local um legislature uh, at the state level and at the federal level the better off you are and at least you're going to they're going to hear you when you call because they know who you are you know i call my congressman's office they know who i am they've met me through a whole lot of different things h2b and things like that they know who i am my call gets returned those kind of things but if you only talk to them once every two or three years when there's you know a quick a, a current issue going on you're not establishing a permanent network with that so yeah it is it's important in the work that NALP does Andrew Gray from a political um, standpoint and Bob Mann it certainly is useful to the greater good but at the, as we found out these are state issues and so you really need to be in lockstep with um, your state association and if you don't have a strong state association you should be part of that association Yes, yeah, and Andrew and, and Bob are great. I, I know them both, and they've been very helpful to me through this process. But they're only two people, you know. They can only do so much, and most of what they do or can do in a positive way, a lot of times, comes from the network that they have established of companies around the country, member companies that have relationships with their state and local uh, representatives in that regard. So they're only as good as our efforts in helping uh, create those and, and, and nurture those relationships. So. Now let's shift to economics. So some of it is immediate, but I think most folks I've spoken to in the industry that I view as mentors would suggest that perhaps we haven't seen the downstream economic impact to our industry yet what's your commentary or items that we can control or not can, can not control but should focus on in terms of economic yeah um i mean we're dealing with again um what's going to happen as we start to uh bring the economy back to life again how many people are going to want to stay on unemployment because they don't want to come back to work because they're making more money with that $600 thing. What's that going to do to the economy? What's that going to do to the economy of our customers, our clients through that through that thing? And and you know which which businesses are going to succeed, bring their people back and flourish? Which ones are going to be in bankruptcy uh, because of the shutdowns and things like that? That is going to create turmoil. 
uh, in the residential side because of jobs, and it's going to create turmoil for us on the commercial side because of companies that are being, you know, affected uh, by forces outside of of anything related to landscape or lawn care, but it's that's affecting their business model. So we don't know. I think May. And I, and I said this uh, last week, May is going to be a very tumultuous time as we struggle with the kind of starting the process of returning to whatever the new normal is going to be on that. And I think June will really uh, set the tone for how things are going to be through the rest of the season on that, because I think we're going to get to where we're going to go in June, possibly into July on that so the second quarter is going to not is going to be memorable uh both uh, from experiences that we've had uh and also when we start to look at our our financial results we're going to see a mixed bag but by the time we get to june and july we're going to start to have a much better read on what's going to happen in q3 and q4 on that and that's going to tell the tale of where we where we're going with this so we need to be really hyper vigilant vigilant on what's going on out there and watch what are what's happening you know what's happening to the companies that employ most of our customers if we're in a residential business what's happening if we're in the commercial business what is happening to the business models of our clients in that regard we need to be on top of that and be paying attention to that because if we're not we're going to have a bunch of surprises if we're aware of it and we're conscious of it and we're thinking about that we can do our outreach because the opportunity is to stay close to your clients at that time and talk to them knowing what's going to happen to their jobs or their businesses and being flexible and being able to adjust to their continuously changing needs. The companies that do that, that pay attention to that, are going to be the ones that do okay. It's, and it's a repeat of 08 and 09 on those kind of the companies that stayed close to their clients during that time period and adjusted uh, as, their, as their clients, both residentially and commercially, had issues and were flexible, retained their customers. So, Fred, do you think there are tactical initiatives we should take with regard to economics so let's say that you have a recurring revenue chemical lawn care business would you be proactive at offering value programs to customers or is it better to ride out your pricing model and programs for the rest of the year and make a shift in 2021 um, well, you're going to do a little bit of both, and you're going to pay attention uh, to what's going on. Just for an example, where I live uh, in Lake St. Louis, Missouri, and the neighboring towns on either side of me, Wentzville, Missouri, and O'Fallon, Missouri, one of the primary employers here uh, is there's a General Motors assembly plant here. There's also Master, a MasterCard worldwide campus. Those are dominant employers here that a lot of the people, if I was in the residential lawn care business, a lot of my clients work for those or the supporting businesses for those. So I'm gonna watch what's going on with MasterCard. I'm gonna watch what's going on with General Motors uh, because their and their supply chains locally are gonna be affected by what's happening with them. So I'm gonna pay attention to that. And if I start to see something happening there, um, I'm gonna have to make sure I'm flexible for my clients now if everything's stable and things are going yeah i can i can kind of ride it out to a certain degree but if all of a sudden general motors uh realizes that their sales of light trucks uh and vans uh start to sh go south and they start to eliminate shifts at the production plant that's going to affect my clients and then i'm i need to be flexible with those clients to make sure i don't lose them so maybe I'm going to have to do some adjustments in my program or, or the billing status or, or some discounting or things of that nature. But what happens with General Motors is going to happen to my customers. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where you're paying attention to those things. If everything's going fine, you can ride it out and then, and then continue to see what's happening in the third and fourth quarter. If something is happening significantly in your immediate marketplace that's affecting employment, 
affecting business models. And again, if MasterCard or GM are my clients, I'm in the I'm servicing them commercially. Yes, that could be an issue too on those kind of things. So does that make sense? I mean, it's you're, yeah, you're, it you're being hyper vigilant at the local level because the people, your customers are the businesses and the people that work at those businesses. So oh, man, I, I had I spoke to Kevin Bedrine yesterday and he runs a True Green franchise in Louisiana and they're having a phenomenal year. He said, you know, we're going to be up double digits. Um, the, everything is played out correctly. COVID was certainly an event, but it didn't stop them from doing production. And I'm hearing that from a lot of the chemical lawn care space. So let's just assume that's true across the board for the purposes of this question. Would you recommend those companies to continue to make capital investments, or would you still say, in our one of our first conversations, the middle of March, would you still say it's time to hunker down and cash is king and keep the cash in reserve? I would, I would hunker down, and be cautious through the end of the second quarter on that, because again, June's going to tell us a lot. So I wouldn't be jumping out and buying, uh, you know, increasing capital expenditures right now uh, on that. Um, and I know the suppliers don't like hearing that, but again, they're they're needing to be hyper vigilant with their customers too, which are the company owners uh, with that regard. But I would be cautious through the end of the for, of Q2, uh, and then what I'm what we're going to learn in June is going to set the stage uh, for. Do we go forward uh, uh, in a more aggressive manner, or do we go cautiously forward into the third quarter and the fourth quarters? I personally think that we're going to be able to be, you know, more robust uh, as we get into the summer. Um, I think the, the 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 problems that the travel uh, and vacation and resort industries are going to have because people are going to want to stay home is going to circle back and benefit us because people are going to stay home. People are going to have, I think, the, the ones that, you know, we're going to keep their jobs, they're going to keep working, the economy is going to start coming back again, and they're going to want to do stuff around their homes uh, in that regard. And I think we're going to start to see uh, the commercial yeah. uh, con the commercial companies also say, you know, clients say, okay, everything's okay, we're stable, uh, we can now continue to go forward with our enhancement plans and things of that nature. But I think everybody's going to be sitting out May and June and watching what happens in regard to that. So, you know, so, you know, 60 days from now, we're going to have a much different view of the world. Are we adjusting, pulling back or moving forward? Or are we, you know, moving on in a normal format? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I have a gut check on it. Uh, but, you know, I, I would not have predicted all this either. So, you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you know? So I, I would move cautiously uh, for the next uh, 30 to 60 days. But again, I'm hearing the same thing for most of my clients. There's more business as usual than not out there. And we're seeing growth. Um, and like we talked about the last time, I think the lawn care side of things is going to see kind of a second spring. Uh, so I would continue to cautiously continue on with my marketing and things of that nature. I wouldn't be pulling uh, pulling the plug on that because I think as people start to settle down, uh, they're still going to be interested in buying lawn care where typically they've been slowing down on that. I think because some of those people put that stuff on hold uh, and now they're going to, you know, when they start to feel like, hey, my the company I work for is open back up again. I'm going back to work. You know, I can go, I can go get my haircut. I can go, you know, go to the store. Uh, you know, things are starting to get back to normal again. Um, I want to get my home, you know, back to normal again on that. So. So next question for you, the S. Let's talk about the S. It remind me what it is. It's not social. It's socioeconomic or? It's, it's actually sociocultural. Sociocultural. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and we're talking about lifestyles, you know, demographics, consumer attitudes, things of that nature, you know, branding, all that kind of falls into that area. Um, these are external forces. And guess what? You know, uh, you know, now, you know, we've our, our society has changed dramatically 
in the last 45 days. Uh, we're not we're not going where we need to go as much. You know, we're staying apart. You know, some of us are wearing masks, some are not. Everybody's staying apart. The the there's 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 arrows on the floor of Walmart and the grocery stores about which aisle to go down, which direction for social distancing and all that. There's been some major, major changes to our lifestyle uh, that uh, that is effect will affect our business. And you know, how do we communicate with our clients about protecting their health while we're servicing their property? And even more so, our employees, how are we handling that uh, because, you know, the world changed. Uh, and, you know, this is where the sociocultural things are. And then how did we react as leaders uh, in order to communicate that and make those adjustments that we had to make really on the fly uh, with those kind of things? And how long will this last? I don't know. It has to be part of the equation of what we look at planning. How long will we have to be you know, if you're in the in the maintenance business, running one or two men per truck, how long will we have to have split shifts in the morning uh, when we're loading and unloading our vehicles so that there's not our, every people aren't all in in close approximation on those kind of things? And that's affected all of us: lawn care, landscape, tree care, things of that nature. Um, you know, tree care crews work very close together. Grounds guys running chippers, climbers, and things of that nature. They've had to completely re uh, organize the, the the basically the physical delivery of their services, uh, and then and again the social cultural stuff is how did we handle that? Right. How did we communicate that? How did we deliver the message? How did we enforce the message? And was it positive, or did we or did we make ourselves look bad through that process? We still have the opportunity to look at that again. All that's still there. It's still happening. In, in some cases, it's increasing. In some cases, it's going away. Uh, but everything's still changing. Uh, for example, uh, my grandson works at Lowe's. They've been open through the whole process, fully open in Missouri. Uh, they didn't have the seed aisle barricaded or anything like that. So they were fully functional and they were busy. Um, but they, but the, and they put sanitation and they put barriers in at the checkouts and all that stuff. But they didn't make their people wear masks. Effectively, yesterday or the day before, um, now they all have to wear masks inside the store. So there's been yet another change as we start to come out of this. And uh, you know, I'm starting to look at some travel again for my to go visit some of my clients here in May and 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 possibly in June. And now I'm discovering, you know, the airlines are now wanting everybody to wear a mask on the plane. Uh, that wasn't true two weeks ago. Right. Uh, in that regard. So this is a still ever changing environment and the socio cultural aspects of it is how are we changing? How are we adapting and how are we handling the changes so that we're being viewed positively by our clients and positively, especially by our employees? That so one, our one last piece on S before we wrap up with T and it's off. COVID topic, but what do you make of the murder hornet uh, influx? And I don't know, I've got a, a, a webinar today with NPMA to determine um, in the United States how prevalent it is, but it's certainly getting front page news. Do you think that's something that lawn care operators should pivot to sharing with their customers? And, and it, it's the fear factor of marketing, I guess, but it, it does play into that um, S piece, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's you know there's another threat that's coming, and it's an external force. You know, I mean, we've been through many of these: the emerald ash beetle, the Japanese beetle, um, you know, the gypsy moth. You know, I mean, we can just count them off, you know, one by one. Um, and what I've heard so far, and I've just only begun to hear about it, uh, is that it's still uh, in a pocket in the Pacific Northwest for the most. For, that's and you know, and that may not be accurate. That's what I know at this point in time, uh, and that it's possible to nip it in the bud if everybody pulls together and works on this together. Um, as I think everybody's learned that we've missed the ball on several of these now, maybe we have an opportunity now to get it right, but the local governments, the state government, and the local pest control and lawn care operators and um, 
landscapers are going to have to work together because this is going to affect the honeybee situation. I mean, that seems to be the biggest threat I think uh, so. is, is the honeybee. So now it's getting into ag uh, on that. And they're, you know, the agriculture, the beekeepers, the agriculture people are going to be looking to us, lawn care pest control, uh, as a solution if we start to work on those kind of things. So we need to learn about that. We need to learn what the control aspects are. So now we're going to learn, go to turn to our suppliers and say, you know, what do we use for this? How do we control this? How do we identify uh, what their nests look like, what they look like and things of that nature? So it's, uh, it's a, a, a threat, but it's also an opportunity on that. And if we come together and work together, we might stop it. So we we'll can see. make that one stop. That would be very cool. So lastly, we've got about five minutes left. Let's talk about technological. One of the pieces I was thinking about, I was at Scott's Miracle Grow during a time where we launched a product called Primo Growth Regulator. So I was thinking to myself, if I were in Michigan and I had the ability to apply and I was in mowing and I had any opportunity, I might be using a growth retardant because I don't, didn't know when I was going to become non-essential. So what are some other aspects of the tea and the pest analysis that are meaningful at this time? Well, yeah, we just talked to, as a matter of fact, one of my peer groups had a very lengthy discussion about the usage of PGRs the other day, for, you know, plant growth regulators. So that's a tool uh, that we can use. It's a tool that we can use when we're having labor shortages, things of that nature. So there's been an increased interest in that. That's technological. Um, obviously, uh, the things that we use internally for our software operating systems and things like that are, are changing rapidly and becoming more and more available and more helpful. But there's a lot of uh, looking at, you know, what is the right platform for me to be using? You know, they all have issues. So we're looking at those kind of things. Uh, I have an exciting kind of thing I'm working with. I have a client uh, that's a startup that's developing an autonomous robotic mower uh, yeah. for the commercial side it's not the little mobot running around in really? your yard in circles that's you know uh 18 inches wide this is uh 36 and 48 inch decks uh and they're probably um going to be able to introduce uh into the marketplace for field testing uh as early as next year uh an autonomous robot and come to market probably a year after they're right now uh, field testing the uh, the machine now in two different parts of the country, Florida and Colorado. Uh, that's going to change, fundamentally change our industry. Uh, and it's not just going to affect the landscape side of things because if they're successful with this, and I think they're going to be, um, the next steps are going to be the autonomous application to seeders, aerators, spreader sprayers, things of that nature. Uh, so the, both the landscape uh, maintenance industry and the lawn care industry in the next five to, to 10 years uh, can be fundamentally changed uh, with the introduction of robotics. Uh, and, is, and, and that's going to be, I think overall, that's going to be a positive, but we're going to have to, that's going to be socio-cultural, introducing those and technological. How do we deal with these from an employee standpoint, from a client standpoint, and from a technological standpoint. So it's going to affect the the E, the S, and the T. You know, when those things start to come into the marketplace, and we will see them uh, within the next five years uh, coming into the marketplace, and and they're they're, be, they're going to be there. Um, can't stop it. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to benefit us. But how do we handle it? How do we deal with it? I love the robotic mowing and uh, I've got to wrap up here to get on Facebook live, but the last event I went to was the NALP workforce summit because we had problems because there was no unemployment, which that's certainly changed. But um, <laughs> we had Husqvarna there uh, showing their new residential model and Frank Mariani and I shared a, shared a moment because he's using it at his $80 million company. And he said, the reasons why it's interesting is that, your entire neighborhood can be mowed at one o'clock on Wednesday. So right now you're out in Missouri on the weekends and you hear a mower at 7 a.m., 9 a.m., 11 a.m., what, you know, all, all day long. Yep. And um, so that that was a big value proposition in selling it. But also 
he said, you know, there are a lot of commercial properties who don't want the crews on site. So, um, and, and this was before we knew what the word social distancing was. And even more so, I can see where this autonomous mowing is really going to um, take off. So that's great. Thank you to, for your time today, Fred. I really appreciate it. And we look forward to hosting you at future events for Real Green. Our clients love what you have to say, and we know you're helping us grow the industry. All right. Well, thank you very much, Beth. And thank you to the Real Green team uh, and uh, Real Green Universe. I'm happy to be here and, uh, and uh, want to keep uh, talking about the things that we need to focus on. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. O-H. I-O.